Hello everyone. It's Sunday morning. My kids watching cartoons, so pretty good time to go ahead and uh, dump a little knowledge on the world here. This morning I want to uh, talk to you about discharging student loan debts and bankruptcy. Is it, is it possible to get a fresh start? Before I get started, I need to give you the standard disclaimer here. I'm not your lawyer. What I'm about to give you is um, educational in nature. It represents largely my personal opinion and it should not be relied on anyone. If you want to be uh, represented by me, uh, you need to call me, email me, uh, we get an engagement letter, you sign it, you return it, and so on. Then we have a contract for uh, legal services and then I'm your attorney. So right now I'm not. I'm just some guy with an opinion uh, about the law. And of course, I am licensed in Arkansas. I am not trying to practice law in any other state. Anything I might talk about here uh, that pertains to another jurisdiction is just uh, purely commentary. Again, not legal advice, shouldn't be relied on anyone. With that out of the way, and my uh, malpractice carrier probably a little happier for it, let's start in earnest. Is a fresh start possible? Well, let's take a look at the problem. We'll get into this a little later, but it's my belief that this begins with the very popular notion that uh, college is just this panacea uh, for a great job. You know, you have to have a college degree. And so there's a lot of pressure for people to go to college. When they get the pressure to go to college, they also have the pressure to borrow money, stay, pay the tuition, pay for living expenses, and stay in school. So that's where it really starts. Not a lot of people get scholarships. Let's face it, most of us aren't smart enough to get a full ride. Maybe the top 10% of the population in IQ is smart enough on the standardized test to get the full ride. So uh, most of us, that's not going to happen. And your average family these days, between a mortgage, paying for their own student loans, which I'm sure they're paying well into middle age when their kids are grown, uh, car payments, insurance, health insurance, etc. They can't pay for their kid to go to college. Uh, and on top of that, uh, you got the government getting involved here. You know, the government is extending all of this free credit. And as a result, what happens when you have a lot of new money being pumped in with no consequences? Well, prices go up. So Tuition is tended to just go up every year. Why? Because the government's there handing out this money. Now, the government means well. It's trying to give people a little boost, trying to facilitate a little upward mobility in our society. Uh, but what really has happened is we've got a $1 trillion debt. $1 trillion with a T. Give you an idea of how big that is. Our entire gross domestic product in this country is about $14 trillion. So $1 trillion, one-fourteenth of our economy is locked up in these student loan debts. That is a god-awful lot of money. So we have uh, most people graduating with about $26,000 in student loan debt. And we have 10% uh, of students winding up with $40,000 or more. You know, your people that were dumb enough to go to law school and borrow money. Uh, so what are student loans? Well, I think that they're the ultimate albatross around your neck. Why? Have a look at this. This is 11 United States Code 523A8. Section 523 of the Bankruptcy Code is a section that deals with debts that are not dischargeable. So. The text is, unless accepting such debt from discharge under this paragraph would impose undue hardship on the debtor or the debtor's dependents for an educational education benefit over payment or loan made, issued, or guaranteed by the government unit or made under any program funded in whole or part by a government unit or nonprofit institution, etc. Well, basically what you got there is every possible permutation of student loan. Uh, and private ones are included as well if you read on there. But you can see filing for bankruptcy is not going to ipso facto get you out of a student loan. Um, 
you're in the same category in Section 523 with uh, fraudsters, uh, people who kill people in drunk driving accidents, uh, uh, people who commit defalcation, people who hide assets, uh, things of that nature. So, yeah, you're in great company. You try to better yourself, and as a result now, you are, uh, you're stuck with it. Uh, and I guess that's okay in some respects, but uh, as I said, it's a pretty big problem. Uh, people uh, sitting around with uh, $26,000 on average, I guess that's a nice car, but it's really the 10% that are in the hole for you or more. They're really feeling it. They're really hurting it because uh, you know, it's not enough to get a bachelor's anymore. Uh, we, a phenomenon called progressive credentialism, look into that. It means that it takes more and more to do the same job, more education, more training to do the same thing. But talk about that a little bit later. So. Look at Section 523. Do you see any way out? Take a good look at it. Think about it for a second. But the bottom line, student loans usually survive bankruptcy. So if you were looking hard, you saw the key language there, which was the very narrow exception for undue hardship. Well, what's an undue hardship? Well, it doesn't mean, hey, I didn't get the job I wanted after I with the pay I wanted, I, I can't, you know, I don't, I don't have quite enough to pay my expenses. And then on top of that, go hang out with uh, my buddies at the club on Friday and Saturday and, uh, you know, keep two or three girls going at once or, you know, that kind of thing. No, not good enough to get you out of it. It is certainly not that uh, you've been sold a bill of goods. If that degree in basket weaving sciences, maybe uh, the professor, the uh, director of the basket weaving sciences department told you what a great future there was in basket weaving. Oh my, it turns out that the economy was not so kind to you. Well, nothing you can do about that. But I'll say this, if you do have a fairly egregious example, you're out there, you live in my jurisdiction and you were sold a bill of goods hard, you know, with all these badges and indicia of fraud, and you were at a private school because the public is going to have sovereign immunity. Well, maybe not as to the actual actors, but you really think you've been defrauded by your major professor and the department and the school for what you were sold. I might want to talk to you. That'd be a very interesting case, maybe a little deceptive trade practices, something of that nature. But, probably not going to get you out of it in bankruptcy. So, an undue hardship, what is it really? Well, it's a judicial determination. It's a judge-made law, case law, the thing that we lawyers love because it gives us a little leeway. We can work with it. So, looking to case law, there are two, well, more than two approaches. But let's talk about uh, uh, undue hardship first. A lot of definitions, this gives you a little idea. It's a notion that the debtor may not willfully or negligently cause his own default, but is rather his conditions result from factors beyond his reasonable control, i.e. couldn't get a job because, uh, God, I tried and I tried, the economy is just awful, beyond my control. I can demonstrate to the court that I sent out 400 resumes, not one bite. Uh, Things of that nature, you know, I, I maybe got disabled, um, maybe I got to, uh, went to a foreign country and uh, broke some trifling law and got locked up for 10 years, something like that. Um, it's not simply a financial burden. It is, n it is implicit that if you're filing bankruptcy, you got financial burden. So that's not good enough. Think of an undue hardship is financial burden plus. You know, not just in the garden variety financial burden, but one that is truly onerous, truly odious, just a bad deal all the way around. So the predominant approach is the Bruner test from N. Ray Bruner. This is a pretty harsh test. You can't, the test is, you have to not be able to maintain a minimal standard of living. You have to show that that state of affairs will continue for a significant portion of the repayment period of the loan 
and that you did try to repay it. So you have uh, three elements to that test. Well, obviously, if you're a thinking person, you've spotted immediately where the rub is. What's the hardest one to prove? Well, the biggest hurdle is showing that that bad situation will continue to the foreseeable future. In other words, skipping back once, the state of affairs will continue for a significant portion of the repayment period of the loan. So is your hard times, are they gonna persist for a long, long time? Well, I'm gonna tell you that in general, garden variety economic trouble, not being able to find a job Gosh, that's not going to help you. I mean, it's got to be extraordinary under the N. Ray Brenner test. Courses, courts do tend to show mercy when we're dealing with, let's say, a disability uh, or very, very persistent long-term unemployment in the, uh, in the face of a very sincere and concerted effort to find employment. Those two things, uh, I've looked at some of the cases and I see that courts are willing uh, to have mercy on debtors that have been in those situations under M. Ray Brenner. Well, then of course you have the perfect storm of things, uh, a lot of things conspiring together to, uh, to really make somebody's life difficult. Um, that happens as well. I've seen some cases where you've got a combination of maybe a little bit of disability plus a lot of hardship and long-term unemployment uh, plus some other extraneous factor in your pass in Ray Brenner. But that's pretty rare. And there are a ton of these cases that are documented and appealed. One way to know that a piece of, of, of law, whether court made or legislative, is a difficult law, the number of reported cases. There are a lot of reported in Ray Brenner cases. I mean, a lot. All right. Well, high bar, if you live in this uh, in Ray Brenner jurisdiction, which is most of the country, you're gonna have a tough time. Now, where I am in uh, the great state of Arkansas, which is uh, north of Louisiana, west of Mississippi, uh, east of Texas, Oklahoma, south of Missouri, uh, right in that neighborhood. Uh, we're in the eighth federal circuit, so we have a very different test. We don't have the Bruner test. We have the so-called totality of the circumstances test. Now. Uh, totality of the circumstances is, uh, it's both, it could be a name of a test and it's a style of test. It's just kind of two in one. Totality, totality of the circumstances is where we're taking uh, a lot of different factors and we're putting them together and trying to reach uh, some just result based upon all of those factors working together. So. The general framework of this test, and don't think of these as uh, elements of a test, think of them as a general framework which we're going to coalesce into some critical mass of, of evidence, a critical mass of, uh, of law here, and we're going to have a singularity out of it and come to a decision, okay? It's not a rigid framework. So the general things to consider, past, present, reasonably reliable future financial resources, your living expenses, your uh, any other relevant factor circumstance, which, wow, that leaves the field wide, wide open. And I'll show you a couple of cases to give you a flavor here in a second. So if you have reasonable future resources, less your standard of living, and it's less needed, excuse me, less the amount needed to repay the loan, the loan is theoretically dischargeable, but those other facts and circumstances, they're going to come into play. So it's not just as simple as a mathematical calculation, but once you have that mathematical calculation in your favor, it's going to weigh heavily for you. Uh, so being uh, completely insolvent, not being able to make your uh, minimum standard of living for having to pay the student loan debt, that is going to weigh heavily for you. And if you add certain facts and circumstances that are going to make it even more difficult to repay, then you can get a fresh start out of bankruptcy under the totality of circumstances test. There's a lot more flexibility in this test than the N. Ray Brunner test. N. Ray Brunner, each of those, those are elements. If you don't meet one, you're out. 
So relevant facts and circumstances are pretty big. Let's show you some examples here. In Ray Long, this is the seminal case where the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals told all the federal district courts in the Eighth Circuit, hey, we're not an Enray Bruder jurisdiction. We are a totality of the circumstances jurisdiction, and here's how it goes. Well, in this case, we have a, a former chiropractor. Uh, this woman, she went to chiropractic school. She did fairly well for a while and then had a pretty big onset of uh, mental problems. And these mental problems absolutely stultified her. She just could not uh, make any more progress in her profession. Uh, she closed up shop. She wound up living with her folks, and then she had a daughter as well. Uh, finally got a job, uh, making not much money. Uh, she's on prescription medicine. She has to sleep 12 hours a day. And so she went back uh, to work as a lab manager, and also uh, she uh, was working on another degree. Well, her earnings, eleven sixty three a month, her expenses ten twenty five. So in theory, she has a little left over to pay her student loan debt. She could have been pushed into uh, some kind of repayment plan. But this is where those other facts and circumstances come in. Uh, well, she couldn't retire her debt within 25 years, but the court had good reason to believe she'll eventually turn it around and cover, recover medically. But the important thing, uh, her uh, the, the extra, extraneous circumstance here was her health, her mental health. While she might recover in the future, the uh, existence of the debt itself was, uh, you know, causing her stress. You know, it's going to be a recurrent thing. Uh, so they let her walk on this one. She got a fresh start. So adding some disability to it. Uh, whether it's mental, physical, and so forth, that's a, a factor circumstance that's going to push you towards a discharge rather than uh, uh, some sort of repayment plan. Now, uh, I might have been conflating uh, in Ray Long with in Ray Reynolds. Uh, same kind of thing. In this case, uh, uh, this person, she had depression, agoraphobia, graduated law school, passed the bar, never found a lawyer job, worked as a secretary for 30000 a year, but her mental health conditions persisted, and she had all kinds of expert testimony from a psychiatrist regarding her mental condition. Uh, the psychiatrist basically said she was lucky to be working at all. She owed $142,000, household income of $3,300, expenses of $2,600, so she had... A little bit left over there, 600 a month she could have paid. But, and I think I was conflating in Ray Reynolds with uh, uh, Long there. Uh, in this case, the recurrent nature of her mental illness, uh, and I believe there was some testimony that the existence of the debt itself caused such anxiety that it would exacerbate uh, this mental illness this, uh, this person had, causing it to recur. So even though she had a bit extra left over, we could contrast that with N. Ray Long. Let's go back one real quick. N. Ray Long, look at the difference there. You're, you're talking about a difference of uh, uh, $38 a month between living expenses and earnings. And uh, we had a little disability into that, and they let her give her a free discharge. She's out. So even though... In Ray Long, we have a, uh, a little bit left over. She was let out. Now here, in Ray Reynolds, say that three times fast. In Ray Reynolds, in Ray Reynolds, in Ray Reynolds. That's, that's a tongue twister. Um, in In Ray Reynolds, we have a pretty substantial leftover amount. I mean, $600. So what's the difference here? Well, here, the court almost made her pay the difference each month, but concluded the stress of having a debt would exacerbate her mental illness and cause recurrences. And she had this expert testimony to back it up. Uh, so that's the difference between these two cases. There was a, a bit of a disability in the first case, but in the second case, not only was it a disability, it was a pretty bad one that just the very existence of this debt was going to uh, cause this person to have exacerbations or recurrences of her mental illness. So, uh, pretty interesting. Now, here, 
is a, a counterexample for you. Educational Credit Management versus Jefferson. Jesperson. Jesperson. He was a new attorney and he filed Chapter 7. Right out of law school, went out and filed it. Now, the trial court in bankruptcy granted him a discharge because his debt was shockingly immense and it quote, sentenced him to 25 years in a desert, debtor's prison without walls. So is that an undue hardship? Well, here's what the court looked at. They said, well, here we have a 43-year-old man. He's in good health. He's a bachelor. He's got two kids from previous relationships. He doesn't have a spouse to support. Now, he owes $304,463.62 in student loans. Wow. That's a brain mortgage if I've ever seen one. His work history, according to the court, was, quote, besmirched by a lack of patent lack of ambition, cooperation, commitment. Just a generally disagreeable guy. You know, you've worked with that guy. He never stays in one place too long, and that's uh, Jesperson, apparently, according to the court. He has a monthly income of 3300 expenses of 2400 The appeals court reversed the trial court and said, no discharge granted, you pay it back. Absence of a fresh start, just for the fact that you owe all this money is not an undue hardship. So, now, had we taken our 43-year-old man here, you were in very poor health. Uh, we had a psychiatrist show up and say that he has a oppositional defiant disorder or uh, something of that nature that causes him to be unable to uh, cooperate and work with others, limits the duration of his employment. Yeah, we might have had a very different case here. But basically, uh, Jesperson is the kind of guy that uh, says, well, you know what, I don't really feel like paying this back. I don't really feel like working for 25 years to pay this back. I just want it to go away. Well, that's not an undue hardship. Not at all. You know, if you're going into these things, don't think of this. It has to be legitimate. Don't think of it as a get-out-of-jail-free card. You know, the courts do not play lightly with people who play lightly with the law. So, uh, in this case... Not an undue hardship, just because it's a huge amount in the debt, just because you got to work 25 years, too bad. What they did is they pushed him into the 25-year contingent repayment plan, which is offered by the Department of Education, a federal regulation. It says after 25 years, you don't owe the debt anymore, whatever's left of it. So if you work for $40,000 a year, owing $300,000 at the end of 25 years, you're out. Uh, whatever's left over is forgiven, because you know, obviously you're not going to pay it off at 40 G's a year, right? All right, so to summarize, in a Bruner, di dis Bruner jurisdiction, you better be disabled or living a very, very sad story. That's a tough jurisdiction. It's an elemental test. If you don't meet one of the elements, you're out. If you're in Arkansas, you're in the Eighth Circuit, uh, you've got a little more leeway, but don't expect a fresh start unless you have a significant hardship of a chronic or recurring nature. The sheer size of your debt doesn't matter. Uh, being younger and good health will weigh heavily. If you're in poor health and you have disability, that's going to factor. And then finally, are you are you trying to do right here? Are you acting equitably? You know, Jesperson there, he wasn't acting equitably. He just wanted to walk away from the debt. You know, he did, couldn't demonstrate that there was something else going on in his life other than the fact that he didn't want to pay it back. Uh, that would constitute an undue hardship. Again, the court doesn't play lightly with you if you play lightly with the law. He who wants equity must do equity, that sort of thing. So, don't expect to walk away if you're age 30. Uh, you know, if you're able-bodied, able to work, and unless you're on Skid Row at age 30, don't uh, don't count on it. So that's the basics of the law. Now, hang in here with me for a minute. I want to uh, talk to you all, and my role is counselor. I'm an attorney and counselor, of course, about policy and uh, about what students ought to do going forward. First of all, my two cents on policy are as follows. Number one. 
let's stop allowing 18 year olds to borrow big, big money that they can't pay back right now, nor will they be able to pay back in the foreseeable future. You know, an 18 year old is still, in my view, a child. You just don't have the requisite maturity. In fact, it's been shown scientifically that uh, the ability to make long-term decisions and understand the consequences uh, and the decision-making center of the brain, they don't really separate until you get in your mid-20s. So you make impulsive, dumb decisions when you're young. You know, so why are we letting them borrow all this money? I, I think it's ridiculous. And on top of that, you have all these professors, administrators and things, they're going to kids, telling them that yes, Education is a, a great thing. You need an education. If you don't uh, have an education, you're just done for in this country. And, uh, oh, by the way, my basket weaving science uh, department, it's the greatest department, major in basket weaving science. And, you know, the employment prospects are wonderful in basket weaving, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, if you're 18 years old and you've got uh, some guy in his mid-40s or 50s telling you all this stuff, yeah, you're going to believe it. I mean, you don't know any better. You don't have any critical thinking skills, probably, uh, which is a completely different uh, thing about public education in this country. Is it really teaching critical thinking skills? I don't know. But let's uh, assume the worst. Let's stop giving all these huge loans to 18-year-olds. Let's find some other way to finance their education. You know, college has become a little more than a holding pen for these uh, 18 to 22 year olds to keep them off the labor market. You know, that's not what it should be there for. It should be there to train very promising young minds to do useful things or to uh, further the field body of knowledge in a useful field. Secondly, we need to reduce the time frame on income contingent repayment. It's not a bad idea to have a, a little jubilee at the end of a, a period of time and say, look, hey, you tried to pay it back, but we're pretty convinced that you're not going to ever pay it back before you die. Now, 25 years, that's a third of your life. You spent the first third in uh, school, maybe even more than a third in some cases, depending on what you did. They want you to spend the next third working to repay this debt. And in the last third, I guess you're going to, you know, get a little bit of time there to do what you want, but then you're done. Well, that ought to be reduced. Uh, really, the entire student loan system, it should be capped. Only so much you can spend. You know, if you want tuition to go down, you want college budgets to get lean and mean, put a cap on the amount of money people can borrow under these fair federally guaranteed programs. Uh, you know, and make the private ones dischargeable in bankruptcy. You know, make them have to underwrite. That's the way I look at it. Uh, if we made these kind of reforms, we could really curtail student debt. We could uh, lower college tuition. Uh, we could, you know, make colleges lean and mean and teach useful things to our young people. Uh, 15 years sounds pretty good to me. I don't know. Secondly, for those of us who have already made our decisions and we're paying back a big student loan debt, let's make 100% of that deductible. Let's not phase it out with income. You know, the argument, I guess, goes, well, you know, if you're, you're making uh, $75,000 a year or whatever the phase out is now, you know, you shouldn't be able to deduct all of this. You can't deduct all that interest because you're making more money. So you should pay more interest. Well, that's not really fair. I mean, it's all relative. You know, presumably the guy who uh, is making 40 a year is paying a lower student loan debt than the uh, doctor, you know, that's making 180 a year, but he's got $110,000 student loan debt. There's no sense to penalize that guy. You know, if, if you know, his income to uh, uh, debt ratio is of a certain amount, then he should be able to deduct it. It shouldn't be an arbitrary line because some people have a better ability to pay than others. This, what we have now is very regressive, in my opinion. It needs to be reformed. So, finally, my advice to young students, and I've uh, lived a little bit. I'm 40 years old. I've been to uh, undergraduate. I've 
been a graduate, I've been to law school, and I borrowed a lot of money. So listen up, because I don't want you to make the mistakes that I made. Uh, not that I regret where I am now, but gosh, my life could have been a lot easier. First of all, don't assume that college will pave the road to the future in gold. College alone is not going to do that. It takes more. And in fact, there are a lot of jobs out there that don't require a college degree that are great jobs that you'll make a lot of money at. Uh, you'll have a pretty good life. So don't just assume you have to go to college. Uh, it's a very bad assumption to make. Now remember, this is being pushed on you by the media, being pushed on you by academia who are promoting themselves, they advertise, good lord, you know, and they have all these statistics out. Uh, you know, a college graduate makes uh, two million over their career over the average Joe. Well, or it may not be two, something like a million, but question that. How did they pick up that statistic? I've never really gone under the hood but you'd have to have a be more specific than that because if we're calculating statistic by including all graduates well we can pull that into a, a nice little mean here and say okay here's this mean here's this mean look at the difference now if on the other hand uh, if the truth is is that if we looked at all college degrees in a population of their own by the way, I used to be a fisheries biologist, so I know statistics inside and out. And here's what I'm going to tell you. Some populations have varied distributions, or they have more than one distribution. It may be a so-called bimodal population or trimodal population, where you have a very nice distribution of things uh, here on uh, the low end. And then you may have something over here on the high end that's a smaller but distinct and discrete population. So if we combine those two, then we have a much bigger population together. Well, you know, if we don't, you know, over here, these guys that are on the, uh, they're, they're on the positive standard deviation in the, in the population, you know, if they're all the uh, doctors, lawyers, and engineers making uh, two, three hundred grand a year, and everybody over here is working at Starbucks, nothing wrong with working at Starbucks, not criticizing, not judging, but, you know, that's our economy. Very, very, very uh, harsh economy right now, and a lot of people who are smart people are having to take jobs that they're overqualified for. Um, so, you know, if this population over here is doing pretty average jobs, you know, they may not be any different from the guy that didn't go to college. I don't really know this to be a fact, but I'm telling you, think critically. Go out there, figure it out for yourself. At some point, I may go under the hood on that and do another video for you. You know, there are a lot of technical careers, a lot of skilled trades, sales. If you're a good salesperson. You've got the right personality to sell things. Hey, the sky's the limit. And you can pick up enough training, enough technical training to uh, do technical type sales. You know, if you became an electrician, you can later be an electrical product rep. You know, same thing with plumbing. Same thing in building trades. Uh, you know, there's just so many possibilities out there. Don't leave them out just because they don't require a college degree. Um, one person who's a big proponent of this is Mike Rowe. If you've ever watched any of Mike Rowe's stuff, you know, he does dirty jobs. He's showing there are a lot of people out there, ordinary people that do a lot of work that has to get done, and they're paid well for it. So, you know, don't discount that at all. Uh, college is not an automatic... Uh, uh, road paved with go to the future to a great job. Secondly, you do decide to go to college. Do be smart about it. Don't major in something that is not job ready. You know, an accountant, job ready in a lot of places, but then you're getting into problems with licensing. Some places they require accountants to have more than a bachelor's degree. But in general, an accounting degree is a job-ready degree. There are so many jobs out there that if you have an accounting degree, the door is wide open. Degrees in engineering, uh, degrees in, um, you know, even in education, you're at least going to get a state job when you get out if you pass the teacher test.
test, you know, nursing. But you know what? In a lot of places, you don't have to go to college to be a nurse. You can do a six-month training, training program, get a license. So another piece of advice, check the licensing requirements. There may be licensing requirements that don't require you to stay in college the whole time, which is my next point. Take the least number of credits that you have to in order to move on to your chosen profession or professional school. You know, if you're a nurse, maybe you just have to do a six months at a community college. If you're a physician, it used to be, uh, I think maybe you, uh, uh, it seems like uh, maybe a couple of years, three years, you could go to college, then you could go to med school. They may require a bachelor's now. Don't do any uh, pre stuff. You know, you do pre law. Why would you want to do pre law? You know, don't major in history. Don't major in English. Major in something job ready. You know, you can go to law school with any kind of degree. You really can. It doesn't matter what you majored in. Um, you know, same thing. Let's say uh, I want to be a pharmacist. Don't do pre pharmacy, uh, whatever that is. You know, get a degree in chemical engineering if you're that bright. Uh, or even a degree in chemistry that might be preferable or chemistry lab stuff. Heck, even uh, let's say you want to go to med school. Take all your med prereqs, and if you have to get a bachelor's degree in something, heck, get it in nursing. Get it in, uh, you know, there are a lot of laboratory sciences you can do it in, uh, health-related type professions, and they're a lot better on you in the job market. They're an automatic built-in fallback plan, and it does not disqualify you from med school or any other professional school or whatever you're doing. As long as you get the prereqs in and you get the bachelor's, think about that. Uh, if you have a job-ready degree, you have a plan B. I like that. That rhymes. If you have a job-ready degree, you have a plan B. Don't forget that. So, the other thing is, we, we go to college or not to go to college, to borrow or not to borrow, be honest with yourself. Don't rationalize your choice. Two things that I have seen people do, and I, I'll give you two stories here. Uh, I often hang out at this uh, place where, uh, you know, men often gather across from the university here in Little Rock. And uh, we have a young guy who comes in and he sits down with all of us older guys and we're all, you know, drinking coffee, kind of shooting a bowl. And you know, he's talking about uh, his major and his, uh, what he's going to do next. And, you know, some people are saying, well, you know, you, you need to start coming up with a plan. And, he majored in something, uh, I don't remember what it was, but it was was not job ready. And, uh, you know, when this was pointed out to him, he said something to the effect of, well, uh, you know, college degree, you know, it doesn't matter what you have. I mean, it demonstrates to employers that you can start something and you can finish it, and that you're smart. And I just got to tell you, there are a lot of things that can demonstrate you can start something and finish it, that you can accomplish and achieve a task. Hey, here's an idea for you. Go join the Marine Corps. You can make it through Marine Corps basic training and be matriculated into the Marines. I would say that uh, uh, you definitely have demonstrated to me the potential employer that you can start and finish a project. <laughs> That's a tough project. Now, if you spent four years borrowing money to major in uh, basket weaving science, that doesn't, doesn't really, uh, doesn't make me very excited as a potential employer. So don't rationalize your choice that way. Uh, you're not thinking critically about what you're doing. You know, the other thing I've heard from people like that is when they do realize that maybe they haven't done the, uh, the best course of action, and then say, well, i got to stick with it to the end. i got to see it through. Don't do that. Cut your losses. Get out. Don't borrow another two years worth of tuition if you figured out, oh my God, I don't really want to major in basket weaving science. I don't know what I want to do. Go do something else. Go get a job. Join the military. Get the military to pay for it. A lot of job training opportunities in the military. Hey, you join the Navy. You learn how to fix those ships. You get on like a nuke sub. You can be a nuke sub guy, a technical crew. You can get a job anywhere in any industry uh, fixing their stuff because you know how to fix everything under a lot of pressure. Do something like that. It doesn't cost you money. You can actually make money, get valuable experience, connections, all these things that you really need to succeed in life. Now, of course, 
Go to that saying, get someone else to pay it, get a scholarship, get a grant. Look for those scholarships that are hidden out there. You know, I went to a little church school, and there were all kinds of interesting little scholarships. I remember one in particular, if you memorize the I think it was 1600 word Westminster Shorter Catechism and can recite it, you got like a $1,200 scholarship. Free money just for memorizing something. Uh, I didn't do it, but that was a lot of work. Hey, I don't think I can remember that much, but just trust me. There are opportunities like that out there. They don't cost you anything to look into, to find, to identify. Find them. Take advantage of them. Finally, if you're going to borrow money, borrow the absolute minimum. Don't say, gosh, I don't want to do work study this semester. Spring, I want to play a little more disc golf. And I want to go on spring break with everyone. Uh, I want a little extra money for that. Or maybe I want a little bit nicer apartment. I want to move in with my buddies that have the nice apartment with the hot tub. Don't do that. That's a very, very short-term gain for a big, long-term loss. Uh, you're in graduate school. You're married. You know, your spouse wants to get you, wants, wants to buy a house, you want to fix up an old house, and you can borrow a little extra student loan money to do that. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. Again, it's a short-term game, long-term loss, a bad idea. You only have one life. If you get yourself into a lot of non-dischargeable debt here, you're going to be working for others. In a way, it's, it's going to be a debtor's prison, in a way. Well... I hope you take that to heart. Thanks for listening to me. Uh, if you got a legal problem in Arkansas, give me a call. You know, I do uh, bankruptcy, I do oil and gas, I do divorce, real estate, probate, uh, you know, all kinds of litigation as well. You know, if, if I don't know how to do it, I will get you hooked up with somebody who does a great job. But, you know, I strive to have the best professional friends that I can that I know do good work. So give me a call if you've got a problem in Arkansas. It's 501-251-1076. Email me at info at robinettfirm.com. And again, this was for educational purposes. It represents my opinion. Don't rely on it. Uh, educational and entertainment purposes. I hope you were entertained by this. Uh, thanks a lot for watching. And I hope you'll come back and see me again sometime. Bye-bye.